you guys to vote. As you might have seen from the reel that I, that I was showing you, uh, this is kind of work that we do. So um, the, the, the way the talk is going to be is my like, less technical talk, so we are, you can relax, there's not going to be too much crazy things staying in your, your, in your brain. Uh, but basically I wanted to, to give something like a big picture of um, kind of how we started, why, uh, the, the, the whole, a bit of a history of the whole thing, and then uh, the, the way that we make things. So hopefully this is going to give you a, like a nice big picture, a good overview of how things are, you know, what, how, how things work uh, in the in general this whole field, and this would you know, enable people who are now starting up or people who are uh, maybe in like a slightly different field or anything like that to, to, to kind of get, <coughs> get interested and search for these different things which I'm going to be throwing you as like it's, it's, I think big picture is, is quite a useful thing to get. So, <clears throat> just a little bit about me. I was born and raised around here, uh, in Dubnitz actually, small town, an hour south, under the mountains, it's awesome. Uh, I studied computer science and uh, computer science actually in, early on in high school, I was this, this kind of a boarding school, uh, quite, quite different and interesting. Uh, and then I went to university to learn some more computer science, but the university was not very much to my liking. There was too much stuff which was not computer science. I had all the arguments with my teachers, so eventually I, I dropped off. So I went to another place which did also have, had computer science, and it had some other things that we had to do. And uh, there was there was like different things which didn't uh, tell me nothing. So I said, okay, computer graphics, graphics you know, this can't be too bad. So I uh, tried it in. Because the other one was computer music, and I thought uh, at this time I don't really want to be a musician professionally. I, I play some stuff, but you know, I want this to be my, kind of my art. If I start, start working on this, you know, it's okay, so it's going to be kind of a job. That's not what I want. So you know, this is persistent to this day, right? Just, I play like part and part. Yeah. And eventually, um, I was into a couple of classes and we started modeling some things, and we got cooked immediately. And I started doing stuff on my own at home, and it, I think even from the beginning, the stuff which is moving and this kind of, you know, has particles and things backing up, this was most interesting to me, it was the most exciting thing. And I, I did get a, quite a generalist um, background, you know, I, I was modeling stuff and I was uh, animating, rigging, I uh, did lot of uh, texturing, lighting, compositing, all this kind of stuff because, you know, I really felt that I should have a... I, that there, were, there were things which were just interesting. And I had a bunch of these personal projects and at this time there was um, quite a lot of construction industry boom, so there was a lot of work for lighting people. So kind of stuff that, for example, now um, the Nishkota guys are doing, <clears throat> so this kind of thing. You know, architectural stuff that, like, where the VA is coming from, the whole this market, but eventually this whole thing died down at, I think, end of the 20, 2008, 2009, something like this. But fortunately, just at this time, as I was doing this, uh, these architectural things and was working on part-time on my effects, um, and sending my reels everywhere, and nobody replies, you know, this is the standard thing, uh, people, it's, people do get discouraged sometimes, but I really want to assure you, you know, that's how it works, uh, people usually don't reply and, and, and feel the time that it, in the right moment, and then they do reply, which is uh, what you should be waiting for. <clears throat> but yeah, I was lucky enough that I just, uh, you know, sent my reel everywhere, so I got uh, called in by Fixamondo, and I went to Berlin, and all these few very cool productions, like um, uh, 2012, and Sucker Punch, and uh, uh, Red Tails, and then eventually I moved on to Scanline in Vancouver, basically I, my whole team, the effects team, moved over there. Uh, but, uh, and yeah, there it was really quite great. We did um, Iron Man 3, which was kind of my favorite thing over there. We did Man of Steel. Uh, but I figured at this point that I want to build something bit, a bit bigger, rather than just, you know, my effects shots. So I got it with my uh, partner, Martin Nydensky, and we started ownership in 2013. So it's been like five years ago, you know, it doesn't look that long. Uh, but this is kind of the, the back story until Mothership starts. So, uh, that's basically what we would cover. And um, in the beginning, it, I think it's very important to say that 
uh, kind of put out that all the beginnings are hard, you know, with whoever you talk at any field, they always have a very hard time in the beginning. And um, uh, it's, it's like, you know, pushing a big weight. So um, once it starts going, it's much easier to push, but in the beginning, it's just um, extreme effort. So the same, exactly the same thing is, is in our industry. And uh, you just have to be persistent to keep pushing until the whole thing starts going. And there is, there is so much stuff to learn that, you know, you can't do it otherwise. And um, uh, I think the most important thing, like the, the, the foundation of the, of the whole thing, uh, is, is, <coughs> is it, really, it really helps if you have some computer science and uh, some art background. So for me it was, I came from the computer science side. There's a lot of people who come in from the art side, but everybody has to kind of make up for the things that they're missing eventually. So in the beginning, uh, it's quite a good time, but like I think all the time, to kind of fill out the gaps. And uh, for me, I was, not, uh, I was not a movie enthusiast when I was a kid. I only started like watching porn movies uh, after, uh, in my mid-twenties, I guess. So um, I had a lot of, uh, on the art side, I, I had a lot, uh, I had a lot to, ma to make up for. You know, I hadn't been drawing much or anything like this. So uh, to me, the whole, the whole European thing uh, that you can travel everywhere and go to these museums and you know, do experimental art, uh, these kind of things were really helpful. You know, experience all the street art. Yeah, everybody has their has their way, but you know, you kind of soak all this uh, culture in, and it becomes you know your art background. Um, and yeah, I think it does help if you have if you know, if, you're, if you're a person who can draw. But even you know, uh, photography helps a lot, a lot, a lot. So if you just have a casual photographer, you know, everybody has their phone these days. It's a bit better with an SLR. Um, but you know, composing images just so you can know what what looks good and what doesn't, and reading a couple of books and uh, uh, watching some lectures by great photographers, this kind of thing uh, take you a long way to actually understanding what is a good picture. Because you know, you, to, to be able to make these things, you need to know what a good picture is. And I used to didn't know, and you know, I was I was kind of too technical and making things that work, but uh, eventually doesn't don't really look too well. But you know, you end up learning. And there's a lot of people who are from the other side uh, who know what a good picture is, but for them, you know, the, the computer part is quite hard. And, you know, there's, there, there's some, some numbers here and there, you know, God forbid, people are afraid of numbers. There's some code here and there, this terrible thing, you know, that there's beast, uh, which is absolutely not scary and completely trivial and easy things, but you just have to not be afraid of it and you have to soak this thing in, you know, if you're, if you're coming from, from this, from the more of the art side. And there is so much now out, you know, out on the internet. You know, YouTube is is brilliant. There's things that you can watch and be not just entertained by learn, you know, like a learn entertainment. It's not a nice word actually. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Uh, so there is so many things in which you can kind of watch, and uh, as you are almost uh, going to bed or something like this, you know, um, instead of just getting entertained, you could get entertained and educated. And this, this is, I think, absolutely uh, amazing that we can do that now. And it's a really good uh, thing to do. And uh, I, I kind of devised something like a strategy. I mean, not exactly in the beginning that I was learning, but kind of when I was you know, aware of at least, at least what needs to, to happen. Uh, and the, the, there's just so much stuff out there that you need to have some kind of a strategy to, to kind of approach all these fields. So uh, my kind of naturally occurring strategy was that I wanted to cover everything first. So I just wanted to have an idea about how everything happens. And one of, this, one of the reasons for that was that you know, in the beginning you, you do your own projects. You don't really work in a place that everybody has a job and uh, you, know, you need to do, to do a certain thing only. In personal projects, to, to make something look nice, you need to be able to, do, you know, to model something, to tweak something to animate. Uh, to, to light, to render, to compose it, all these things. So, kind of out of necessity, um, I figured, okay, I need to be able to uh, to do these things, uh, you know, at least you know adequately. Uh, but then, eventually, find something that that I really like and specialize in. So, uh, to me, it was in the beginning kind of obvious that the, the effect stuff, you know, the the particles, the dynamic stuff, you know, the, the water, the explosions. This was it was fun, like obviously. Uh, this was most fun, but I think for a lot of people it's not extremely clear. So it helps out if you do everything. 
it does help out to see what actually is the thing that you enjoy. So find the thing that you enjoy, learn everything, all like all the fields to a, <clears throat> to an adequate level, so you know what you're doing and you know how things work. But then get the thing which you are very interested in and fail in this direction. So yeah, for me this worked quite well. Um, but eventually, eventually um, you, you kind of start piling up some stuff and it was like that. Yeah, I started to have some, have some personal project, projects and it was like 1, 2, 5, 10, 20. But you put them in reels and you send them around and nobody is applying. Uh, so this just means that you have to get better and that you need to hit the right moments, uh, both of these. So you just keep improving and until the, the moment comes, yeah, it's difficult sometimes, you know, people have day jobs and um, other other things that they need to be doing, but you need to, to do that, you know, this progress is difficult. Uh, but eventually there is an opportunity, so for me there was this, uh, like the 2012 times, that basically the way it happened was that simply everybody else who had been working on these things and uh, uh, had the trust of the studios and everything, everybody was busy. So at this moment, they just needed to find the new, uh, new person. So it would be, it to be that you know, I was this I was the person that was the most recommended by some people who they trust. They say, okay, uh, we need people, we need people, what do we do? Uh, like we call this guy that we know, this guy that we know, like everybody's busy, so what else we can do? Okay, uh, there's this guy in the forums who is posting some nice stuff, okay, get this guy. <laughs> you know, basically how it works. I mean, it's simple, but you know, that's how it is. So once, once you get in, then it becomes a bit more different, the way that you work, because um, you, at, at least in the, in the movie, in the visual effects field, and to me it was a bit strange that I did almost no you know, like previous work before, uh, before visual effects. You know, I did this freelance lighting thing, but I didn't do you know, uh, like all, all the slow way to commercials and TV and then the movie stuff. I just, you know, I was lucky enough to just land into the movies. So it's a, it's a very different, different, different situation to be uh, from uh, doing everything at home or like in a very small company. To, uh, to the movies because uh, in the even in the smaller like like we are 15 people but everybody still specialized so people specialize and they need to do their their thing quite well but you but it's always a team effort like the the, the final shot it's always a lot of teamwork and you know almost never a single person has produced the whole thing and even if they did there is people who connected to the client and there is the, the guy who is making your computer run so it's always a team thing you know never uh, like one man show. So the most important thing becomes teamwork, and being able to have good communications with your with your teammates, uh, being nice to everybody, uh, being open, um, sharing these kind of uh, you know soft skills like dealing with people becomes the most important thing. Being able to listen, uh, the, the most important skill of everything. So a lot of improvement happens needs to happen there on the team front. And to me, you know, like the first years were mostly. Uh, learning not to try to do too much and um, be, a, be, a, be a great friend to, friend to everybody in the company, uh, just like uh, understand people and uh, it's you know, really quite, quite, quite usual, ordinary, normal things, but this is what makes you a good team player. Like, be a good person. And there are soft skills and there are hard skills. So yeah, this is kind of one of the soft skills and you know, hard skills are your technical things. And it really helps that you soak a lot of these things in and keep trying uh, things. Don't kind of settle for what you already know because it worked a few times. Uh, it's always uh, different the next time over, so you have to really be uh, be working on these uh, and learning uh, on, on the technical skills all the time. It's super important. So eventually, uh, when I decided that I want to just make something bigger, it was quite a uh, you know, kind, of, kind of an intensive thing to me, it's a bit difficult to describe. But you know, most people get, uh, my friends, the, the guys that I used to work with, they were, get, uh, they were comfortable in uh, like, uh, being well paid and working on, the, working on nice projects. It was just, I was, you know, I, I had made so many of these things already, it, it, was, it was getting easy. And I thought, you know, I can do maybe something a bit bigger. It feels like when you do stuff which you feel is easy, uh, then to me it feels like I can, I can do more. So uh, I went to the, you know, in the starting my own company route, and it, it's not for everybody. So uh, I think one of these other important skills to be, skills is to be able to listen to yourself without too much kind of you know layers on top of that. To listen to yourself so you know what you really want to do. 
And to me, it was just the thing that I really wanted to do. And uh, uh, for every for somebody else, it's going to be something else. But you have to be able to know what you really want to be doing. So so it can take you to be happy. Otherwise, you know, if if, if you do stuff that you don't enjoy, nobody wants to do it. Uh, but of course, you know, I'm, I can only do good. Do a few of them, a few things well, and it's very important that you have other people that are good in the other things that, that need to be done. So um, it's very important to find people that you can partner with and delegate to the things that you don't enjoy or you're not good at, which both usually are the same things. Like the things you don't enjoy, you you can't be good at. So I'm just from you know being a good team player, this opens you up to a lot of potential partnerships because people want to work with you. So this business is quite small, and all of the people that you meet once, uh, you meet uh, more times usually, and it, it really helps if you have been working well with people and they want to work with you, and um, this is this is where your partnerships and your uh, professional relationships are going to come from, so you have nurtured these and this is going to pay off. Okay? And the reason we uh, wanted to make bottleship and the, the, uh, what we wanted to do different is to have this uh, culture which is focused on the people and on you know uh, and on like the environment rather than uh, necessarily just the bottom line or you know something like that because eventually the people make everything uh, in start to do all the all the rest is quite quite disposable you know there's these computers uh, then there is there is buildings but our business is not very capital intensive you know we don't need to <coughs> Buy the factory uh, for the uh, many million, so you can produce something. Uh, it becomes even more uh, fo ever, ever more focused on the people. So nowadays, you know, we've seen the guy from Google talk. He will, will discover basically how you eventually you'll be able to run your entire studio on the cloud. So it's going to be just you, a guy with a not even a workstation, you know, this tiny little box, and uh, all the rest is going to be. Uh, taken care of uh, by Google and or, or Amazon or you know whoever, and you just pay part of the pay them a bill, which would be a part of your expense on the project. And that's pretty much it. So the people are pretty much everything that that a company like ours has, and uh, being focused on on the environment that we rely on, I think makes uh, makes of sense. And it's not something which is too hard. You just need to be uh, it's like an extension of uh, of teamwork. So uh, listen to people. Uh, just to take care of them when they need something, mentor the people who are growing, these kind of things. Uh, and the, the other thing is that we really want to be focused on something and do it really well, which of course comes from um, our fields, I mean, Martin's fields when we were uh, still artists only. And uh, yeah, you, you tend to keep doing what you've been doing because there's so much accumulated experience. But it is uh, quite important that you are focused on something that you do really well. Because you know when the client decides where the next project is going to go to, uh, to them is uh, it's, it's a clear choice when somebody specializes. Like, these guys do really great, great creatures. These guys do really great uh, effects. These guys uh, you know create great images of buildings. So uh, it's easier to, for the client to pick you if uh, there's something that you really stand out with. You know, and uh, they say okay now when we if we have a car crash effect, then you're going to go to these guys because these guys have done so many of these things. You look in their backlog, they, they, they explore this, uh, so you think that they, that they are specialists in doing this kind of thing. It makes a lot of sense. So yeah, it, it does bring in more work eventually. Um, but you can't be really specialized in doing just one thing, because just like being an artist, the company also uh, needs to, uh, to cover a lot of uh, ground just put a product, a product out there. So to us, this was the environments that we started focusing on, on, on with the effects and of course composting. Because just to have a product out, you know, we need to put in uh, all our editors and everything with the photography, uh, create all of the, the post processing effects and uh, uh, like get the right color and, um, and all, all of that. Uh, so yeah, we had we the composting department, I think, since very early on. But then we went to make an environment because these kind of things always happen in an environment. Um, you know, it's never just something which is you know standalone, almost ever. So uh, we went to the environments and you know, saw the, uh, the the trees and the and, you know the rocks and all this kind of nature and stuff. Um, 
And <clears throat> that's kind of the way that, that this is kind of the story uh, up until now. So we are now, I think, 15 people, something like something like this. Uh, when we were started, we were just two. And it is, yeah, things are growing. There's going to be also news soon. So yeah, this is the trajectory. But besides that kind of growing up story, I um, want to also show you, uh, speak a little bit about, uh, about how we do stuff because you know these things are useful and interesting. And um, we are centered on our 3D uh, part of the of the, the, the whole thing is centered, centered on Max that we use to model things and uh, and uh, light and render and to host our FX tools. And uh, one of the main bigger of these tools is Think Particles that we use to um, do a lot of um, our bodies work. So this is a rigid body, soft bodies, the cloth, uh, sometimes. And this is really quite great because it's, uh, it's giving us very uh, productive options. So uh, we had, a, I think, well, like a couple of months ago, we had a situation where there was, uh, there was a show that came into us and said, we have uh, worked with these guys who gave us one version for two three months, and we don't think this is going to work. So can you help us out? And we gave them. You know, next week we gave them eight versions. So this makes directors happy because they want to direct. You know, you just can't just give them one thing and then and, and, uh, and uh, expect that they approve if they want to actually create. Uh, and we gave them like eight versions next week, and the guys were ecstatic because they could see the thought the thought process and they could connect to it and uh, pick the thing which is going in a direction that's mostly uh, fitting what they will, would imagine and, they, and, and see all, why all the rest of the options are not as great, which is um, reassuring them afterwards that we can pick the, the best option and uh, moving uh, and like make, making them more confident in the, in the movement forward. Uh, so it's great to have a tool like Thinking Particles and uh, the, the, the fragmentation tools that, that we have, like, like Rayfire, because they enable us to be really fast. And you know, VFX, it's about speed. Uh, we have also all, all of these secondary simulations, like when a building is crumbling, we, we have these big shapes uh, simulated first. And then just to add juice to it and you know, to, to make it feel big, we add all of these very small uh, uh, like three kind of you know uh, gravity uh, these small uh, elements, and we did them within particles also. We set them to frost, which is a really cool measure and instancer. Uh, works great with very that we're going to be talking about later. But yeah, uh, and uh, the other key uh, field that you need to do when you do the effects, uh, basically you need uh, rigid soft bodies like the bodies. Uh, and you need uh, volumetrics, the fire and smoke and mist and all these kind of things, and you need water. So for water, what we use is fuel effects. Uh, again, because of the speed and flexibility, you know, it's, as I said, visual effects is about speed, because there's always schedule and a budget. So the, the goal is to... I think the mic is gone. Do I need to Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, it's about speed, the effects that you always need to, to fit as much as possible into a confined schedule and budget. So if you're fast, you can fit a lot, and you're, if you're slow, you can fit, uh, fit less. And if you uh, end up uh, having your stuff finalized before the deadline and before the, the money ends, that's when you win. If you don't, that's when you don't win. So it's very simple, you have to be fast, like uh, doing things like a lot of the tasks that we do are heavy and difficult and have a lot of stages and things are not naturally fast. So uh, a lot of our work is to find ways that we can do, to do, do stuff faster uh, and uh, make more things. So this is, you know, uh, part of the skill. And with two effects, uh, we, it, it gives us very, very quick options that we can uh, we have quick simulations, uh, the renders are also quite, quite, quite good, so nowadays the VA volume grid is something that we use to render uh, smoke a lot because it's quite fast. It does uh, like a couple of features, so we also uh, still render some things with VFX to VA uh, again, <laughs> but uh, most, uh, mostly it's, it's, it's uh, great. And uh, we have this, usually again we do these big shapes just like with the, uh, with the bodies, we do these big shapes. That we um, that we then that we kind of guide uh, that are guiding the whole thing. So 
Uh, this is defining the silhouette, and it's all, always very important to have a very, uh, this relation should be very directable. So, uh, in, in both in time and space, so you know how the whole thing is going to move to cover which part of the frame and uh, at which part of the, of the shot, like earlier or later, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to produce this behavior. It's very important to be able to have control over these broad strokes. And then you have the, 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 the finer detail, which also is necessary because with the broad strokes you can only do um, things which are, that they are very important and momentous in your simulation, but they don't take care of the, like all, the, all, the, all the small things. So it's, it's very uh, important to be able to kind of use textures and particles like that we do to just uh, add some finer detail into the simulations. And it's uh, important to kind of keep these two, two things separate. So usually you, uh, you take care of the, of the big shapes and the big motions first. And then uh, let's say you, know, you have this big emitter and then you can add this to, to the emitter some displacement, for example, or you can uh, add, use some texture to break up how the uh, fire and smoke, for example, get emitted. So they're not in this big flat uh, thing. That's something that we and we do we fight against all the time because the, the easiest thing to make uh, things to make are quite smooth and quite uh, they have these big features only. So a lot of the, the thing that we do is that we, we keep adding these smaller uh, minute things and uh, actually the, the feeling of scale and size you know, which we almost always need to be getting uh, to make the whole thing appear massive and dramatic and impressive. Is that it, what helps to, to sell this feeling is the difference in the scale between the biggest things and the smallest things. So we tend, uh, we're trying to always to make the smallest things as, as small as possible. Uh, so you know, the smallest that you can see, just so that there is a huge difference between these things that are quite small and the other stuff which is quite big. And this makes the, the big thing actually look big in a way because you can visually compare it to some stuff which is uh, tiny. And uh, having, uh, having these, uh, yeah, like dealing with particles and textures uh, is helping us out a lot because you know you have the, the silly big thing, but then you can add some parts, some uh, some particles to kind of break it up a little bit or, or add uh, small features, and uh, this way you can you can get this, this this feeling of something which is massive. Um, something else that we do a lot is that we are not. Uh, we try to, to, to break things uh, into a lot of uh, different setups and different simulations because it's very easy to uh, to try to make some make like one event in one simulation. It's kind of simple to imagine, but the problem is that that once uh, you get uh, when you start getting comments about these things, the comments are quite specific about certain features of, of something. So let's say you have a big explosion and it it shakes off some windows. Uh, so yeah, we have this, uh, let's say a big explosion is shaking a building next door, and uh, we have the, the simulation of the explosion, which is great. But then you have some dust, which is get, which is uh, coming from the shaped of building. So if you do this thing in, uh, let's say this thing in one simulation, uh, and then you uh, go to the director and he says, okay, I like the explosion, but the dust is a little bit too thick, maybe. That's uh, kind of type of comment that we would be getting quite often. So for you uh, to change uh, dust then would mean that you would have to redo the whole thing again. I mean, not maybe from the ground up, but you would need to do a change. And this would mean another uh, simulation, which would be quite slow because it has both the explosion that you shouldn't have touched in the first place and the dust, uh, which would slow you down. So if you have the explosion separate and the dust separate, uh, then you can uh, be addressing only the comments on the dust and move much faster and the, kind of cover the expectations of the director because they always want you to only change the things that you have commented, that they have commented on and if you come back to them and say, okay, yeah, we, we have the dust uh, working better now but, they, uh, but uh, the exposure is a bit different and they're going to say, like, why is this different? I told, you guys, I told you guys that I like this. Did you put work into this extra? Uh, are you charging me for stuff that I don't want? You know, it's not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> So when we break these things into these separate pieces, it allows us to address, uh, you know, in each piece, uh, like more locally address the comments and be able to, uh, to, to work faster with smaller things, uh, which are always faster to work on, and then build the big picture from all these smaller pieces rather than trying to handle something which is huge 
uh, and it becomes so wieldy. There's uh, limitations in, 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 in the render time, in memory, and, uh, all, the, and all these things that makes, you, that, that makes uh, it like that, that you get most reward when you focus all of your resources on a, on a small area. So, you know, if you imagine like you have a, a city getting destroyed, like you can, of course, not ever get the whole city simulated in one go. And the more, uh, but you have, let's say, you know, 10 million polis that you can put into a simulation. If you if you put in the, the 10 million polis into one building only, it's going to have much more polis per pixel on the screen. Uh, and if you have 10 of these that are playing on the screen, instead of uh, distributing your detail like thin on the uh, in the frame, you're going to have uh, all the detail that you can manage in each one of these separate uh, events happening. And this is going to give you much more detailed picture. So this is something that is, uh, has been proven to be a very good strategy. Of course, this thing is not as easy as it sounds because sometimes when you have interacting events, it's, uh, you lose from actually splitting everything up because um, when things do not uh, simulate together, they do not interact with each other. Um, and you can, you can go around this by, by, by making simulations dependent. So first you simulate the really big things, and then you simulate something smaller, which is by its character is too small to influence the big thing. So uh, you, you only have the big thing influencing the small thing, and the big thing is some simulation which is cached already. So, so, so this is really something that you do a lot, and it, it helps out. Uh, but when you have two events which are kind of from the same character and they need to be interacting, it's difficult to split them up. Uh, so, so this is something that needs to be carefully done to split things in a way which does not actually make things slower for you and does not create too many problems. Um, to, to have all the, as much as uh, as many of the as many as possible of the important interacting things being simulated together. Uh, and the other problem with uh, splitting up everything is that you get increased complexity. You don't have one simulation anymore, you have you know, dozens, which is the usual case in our shots. And just dealing with this, you know, um, rendering everything and uh, preparing to for the comp people so they have control over everything separately, this takes some effort, you know, it, it does take some experience also that we can build up. Um, some custom tools that we have written and all this kind of stuff. So there is an added complexity. But um, it's something that's magical. And now the last major component of uh, VFX <coughs> is water. Uh, actually, there is one more. I think. Let me see. Uh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> so uh, water is the most complex of all effects, and you have done some. What is that? See where the. Okay, just looking at these slides. Yeah, we're dealing with water quite a lot, and uh, we have, we started with NIAD um, that we still use from time to time, uh, even these days, because it's very productive. Uh, it's very fast. This, the quality of the of the solvers is great. It's um, well interacting with the, with the other parts of our FX tool set, with forms that we use for meshing and the uh, we use for the for the points. I'm gonna I'll be talking about these things a bit later. Uh, so <clears throat> it has been really good for us, but unfortunately. Autodesk uh, bought uh, and they're, they're managing the whole technology in a way which is you know, not exact, not the most productive. Uh, hopefully this, uh, things are going to, be, uh, going to be getting better, but there was not something that could replace it um, you know, immediately or in the, in the years since they bought it. So we have also been looking at Houdini for water setups, um, still are the, in this direction that we are going to probably have something to show in the coming months, I guess. Uh, but. Uh, um, there is fortunately some stuff which is coming up that is um, doing a decent water in mud for Sphinx that we uh, have that we use, use for some effects. Uh, but here's the, there is also uh, Max Fluids now, which is uh, based on the same technology that that NIAD was founded on. So you know we are look, we are checking these options out. Of course, you can't go with no slides either. Uh, okay. Uh, as I said, yeah. Uh, if, if, if you besides the simulation that you do, 
Um, the, the, like the base simulation that you do is only the foundational layer. Uh, we, we tend to add a lot of layers to make our water look nice. And you can see here, for example, in this uh, in this uh, breakdowns, how many different parts it takes uh, for the water to look nice. Because you have this base simulation, then you have the um, um, like the misty uh, things and the splashy things, all of, the, all of them are added together and you can't just have one of them because you know it, it, it looks too, too dry and too uninteresting. So you mix up a lot of uh, these components and for the kind of main body of water uh, we use Frost, it's a easily great instancer and measure. It's very fast so we take the, the particles that, we, that the simulation produces we feed them to the to this measure and we get this body, um, which is like the like the main water surface, you could say. Um, we can control the, this water surface quite uh, quite quite well with uh, the particle two sets that Krakatoa is giving us, uh, and Krakatoa is a, a nice uh, particle two set that can control your particles. I think I did some of these things in my master class with Krakatoa and Frost. But also, it's a quite great render, quite unique, because it allows you to render these billions of particles, like we routinely render hundreds of millions, or like have gone over a billion a couple of times, in a way which is um, which is volumetric. Like you can see here, this uh, mostly splashy kind of water. That's what, what is coming from there. Uh, so it gets this volumes, nice big, soft and deep volumes from these uh, hundreds of millions of or you know, hundreds of hundreds of millions of particles. And it looks really amazing for uh, you know, these splashy effects. Then the last component, I think it's then the last, is all the particle effects. So all the time you need to have either some small, uh, small effects like. Uh, there's some piece of glass uh, crashing here and there. There's some bullet hits or something, and they, they throw some debris. Um, there's some snowflakes. Uh, all, there's all, all of them, these kind of smaller effects, for which we either use PreFlow uh, as a quick and easy uh, first first level uh, instrument, or we use <laughs> thin particles, which again, you know, being this fully featured, really great tool set, is allowing us to. Kind of get get all the way to all of these effects uh, inside it, and it's really a comprehensive. Pretty much everything that you that you need to do that we have needed to do, we can do. There on this thing in this particles um, effects world. Um, there's also another uh, another uh, field that is uh, particles which are which are flowing on on velocity fields. So this is something an effect which looks a little bit different, and I think see an example in. Few shots with a kind of dreamy sequence here. Not, uh, not in the real, but uh, hopefully you might have caught, caught a glimpse in it in the in the reel which was playing before the the course. So there's there is this field, there is this particle scrub that are flowing on these cloth bands, and around the girl there is this bands which are swirling around her, and uh, there is this energy like. Uh, Stuff flowing through this, uh, through this through these bands, and uh, we we tend to, um, to to get these kind of effects quite often. So there is this flowing, like some matter or some energy is flowing through some field, and for these things we use a tool called Stoke, um, made by the Box guys on the same company which makes Krakatoa um, and uh, Frost and everything. Um, so we, uh, we, use, we use that to kind of send the particles through, and again, it's very productive. Many millions of particles that you can use. It's really quite, quite good. So besides the effects, as I said, the, something else uh, which is key that we in, in, the, in the work that we do is environments, and these are pretty much present uh, almost uh, almost every time when there is effects work. So if, unless the environment is coming from photography, something that was shot on set, then there is an environment that 
uh, you know, you've, you, you have seen the, the ragdolls in the movies, so more often than not, the, there is a guy on green screen being scared of, uh, you know, that this is something which, which is not really there. And, you know, it's not a, it's not a mental condition, it's that uh, that's how people need to, until, until virtual production gets quite more advanced, that's still, you know, what we need to do on set. Uh, so what we do, we, we, the way that we approach environments is kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's our way, which is, uh, uh, you can see our effects background in the way that we approach them, because we tend to kind of find a way that we can, we can, we can make them fast, we can populate with, uh, uh, let's say, with trees and these kind of things, uh, but there's always quite a lot of, you know, old-fashioned work, like, there's a person who is uh, carefully designing, let's say, a treescape and placing all the right uh, types of trees at the right places um, and uh, modeling, let's say, some rocks and um, uh, designing the, some, some, some terrain in the, in the like, yeah, artistically directed way. These things are also, also obviously very meticulously analyzed in the effects. So um, you have some particles that you're throwing on the ground. Uh, some some rocks, but you know what the density of the rocks, what's their character, uh, what's their distribution, so they're not too boring. Uh, if, uh, like all these things can get intensely scrutinized. Uh, so uh, to, to uh, get some interesting textures, we use Megascans, which have a really great uh, array of very very high detailed uh, textures of these uh, natural environments. And uh, for modeling vegetation, we have tested out grow effects, uh, which is quite cool for these uh, things that you need to integrate in your in your DCC. So in Max, for example, if we have a tree which needs to grow around some obstacle, we will use that. And speed tree uh, for the just huge incredible libraries. Uh, basically, it has all the all the types of trees that you would ever need, and um, you can just export from library. And then if you need some adjustment, the uh, tools inside are quite great, kind of unmatched there in this way. And to distribute all these things around, we use Forest Pack. Uh, the I2 guys are around here. Uh, we want to say, say hi. Uh, it has very nice distribution options that you can use these maps and uh, splines and rules to, ar to uh, arrange your objects, which are like trees and rocks and shrubs and flowers. Around, around the geometry. It is working very nicely with VRA, which is our main editor. Uh, then it has, um, uh, it, it supports instancing quite well, so uh, most of the stuff that, that, that you can throw at it is going to render. Uh, hundreds of millions of, uh, of bodies and you know, many, thousand, many thousands of trees and these kind of things. It's quite amazing. And as I said, yeah, here is our great, uh, is our uh, main render. So all the stuff which you see as a geometry, like things which are kind of solid, uh, is also rendered with VA. Um, it's kind of rare that something is as accessible from one side and as comprehensive from the other side, like VA is. So it's difficult even to make things which look, you know, too bad. In the beginning, just throw a couple of lights and a great material, on, and everything is fast and looks looks okay. And then from there on, you can uh, only move uh, upwards. So for us, you know, we don't usually have these intricate lighting scenarios, you know, indoors where uh, the whole thing is getting illuminated by a small light. Usually our lighting is kind of simpler because everything is ground and uh, outdoorsy. Uh, but sometimes it happens, and it's very, it's very easy for us to set up our lighting in the way that, that is, you know, uh, meticulous. And uh, we can get all of the stuff that we need uh, for the thing to go to comp, and this is this is easy to kind of uh, underestimate because you know you see a, a, a new render uh, shows up you know somewhere you know like I can say a yeah, redshift showed up, but when you start working it working with it on a project, you see that there's so many of these small things that that you need uh, for the whole thing to actually be used in, in, in a, to solve all the problems that you need in a real production that in these newer products and with like younger products, these things are not there because it takes, you know, decades of history to actually accumulate all of these small features. And with VA, we're really happy that we haven't, uh, we have almost never missed something. So almost all, almost always when we need uh, this tiny thing, you know, to let's say create an additional render element which only shows 
uh, the part of the character which is near some some effect, for example, so the comp people can go and uh, do some particular work on this on this area. Uh, we have a VRA tool which is covered. But there's just like this huge list of features which you know look exotic and you might use them only a few times, but uh, if we trust it that when we need it, it's going to be there and it's going to save our project. And on the other end we use is Capitola. As I said, you know, it's this specialized uh, render which is quite unique. Uh, it has this very comprehensive tool set to control particles that you can uh, control like where they are, their density, color, so on, all the information. It's very data uh, driven uh, way of looking at things. And it is uh, pretty much, I don't think there's anything which is, which is approaching it in capability of uh, rendering as many points and having this look. And it's coming from the, it, it being quite a different approach. It's not doing ray tracing, it's like just sorting the particles uh, from the camera and from the lights. Um, and it just draws points. So, yeah, point renderers are really great for doing these kind of effects. Specialized can only do one thing, but it can do it really, really well. There is, has been some uh, hopes that it's going to integrate with VRA better, but we'll see what this goes. Uh, so, <coughs> all these things, as I said, these are quite heavy, uh, and because of the <coughs> type of work we do, um, which everything is quite intense, so simulations are huge, render times are long. We need a, a, a bit more render power than the standard company of our size. So we have about 60 machines now on the farm. Um, we have our, our own inside uh, room where you know it has this crazy air conditioning, and the IT person has you know twice the, the thickness of their jacket than than all the usual guys that are in the office. And you know when they go to work, they kind of. Uh, Sitting up with this polar expedition thing, yeah, you know, it's a good opportunity to make fun of them. But yeah, it is cold actually in there, uh, and uh, it takes some work to, to keep everything going, especially when you have the security requirements that, that nowadays we have. It's, it's much more than you would think, uh, just IT work, you know, uh, get all the networks, uh, keep all the networks working well, uh, have this. Um, all the different sub-networks because uh, our clients' demands are that basically that you can't have the direct access to, from the internet to the, to the stuff inside, uh, which is for, for a good reason because otherwise things can very easily and quickly go bad. So, um, lots of IT work, I think I can uh, combine these two slides. So, uh, yeah, lots of IT work um, that, that, that takes for the whole thing to run um, smoothly. And we have benefited a lot though from kind of planning and building for the next step of development and not for the current one. That's a lot lesson that we can learn from uh, previous companies that we have worked at is that if you solve the problems that you currently have, this is like the worst uh, the worst this is the, this is the worst moment to solve problems so when you already have the problem. So the best moment to solve the problem is that when you anticipate the, the thing which is going to happen in like a couple of years maybe, or you know, sometimes in the future, and you have plenty of time to actually devise a solution, uh, come up with the best uh, options and implement this framework that eventually <coughs> when, when the thing happens and you, you do have this, uh, this expanded needs, everything just falls into this framework, everything is smooth and easy, because otherwise, <coughs> Otherwise, you, you you scramble and you, you you tend to put a premium on the speed and on the, the cost of the solution and not on this, um, how effective it would be, and you end up with these sucky solutions which are kind of band aids, you know, fixes a problem for right now, but then you uh, create more problems in the, in the long run. So you know, this good planning and solving for the next step, I think, uh, can, can help us a lot. And. Um, as I said, well, we do not use, we don't have direct security access, kind of one of the IPC looking in VFX that um, the clients, uh, clients yeah, are sending you a person to, to do this big check, and there's a bunch of things that you need your infrastructure to cover. So the way that you access the internet is actually through a remote desktop kind of client that uh, accesses uh, access a server that Pretty much, you send you send him the the, the, the mouse clicks and uh, and the key presses and sends you the result back, but there's no copy paste. 
no drum box and stuff like that. If you have, if you have all your music with USB sticks, it's not going to work here. Um, so, to kind of access all, the, all of this stuff uh, on, on the render farm, we use Deadline, uh, which is quite a popular uh, render farm manager, and it, it is integrated well with all the stuff that you use, you know, uh, Max and Maya and uh, Nuke and PD. Uh, it's very accessible uh, with Python, and Python is the language in our field, so you know, every piece of software, uh, libraries, whatever, everybody is using, using Python, so if you're into coding and you want to do some stuff in that field, this is what you should, should be learning. And it has a bunch of in, in, uh, cool plugins that like has uh, for uh, things that, that are useful, like uh, the stuff that draft that we use to create uh, short these movies out of the uh, under the XR frames, which is uh, the thing which goes to shotgun, like the, this web-based uh, production management that we got as well. And nowadays, it's also our cloud gateway, so we expand it, we're experimenting with cloud rendering, and uh, the deadline is as simple as, you know, you're looking at your render farm, hit the button, uh, get a thousand more machines, for example, and you can uh, just think them as an extension of your render farm. So for the ARC business computer transparent, we just need extra power, we rent it out for a while, and uh, then it's gone, when we don't do it. So it's quite, uh, quite nice way of it. So we don't have production, but we have production. <coughs> uh, and to, to just manage the way that the, the whole information is moving through the studio, uh, say you know, we have uh, 15 people and everybody's producing versions and uh, they need to be checked out by the supervisors, how then we can need to go to the client, uh, we need to be aware of how much resources we spend, how much uh, man days we spend on each different task, how we on track, how we, how we be kind, are we going to need to change schedules or something like this? Yeah, get somebody else to help. So you need to be able to, be able to know what is happening in the, inside that, that studio uh, and on certain projects. So Shogun is really great, great for that. Uh, besides uh, tracking all the expenses that we, that we are making, uh, basically who is working on what, uh, it also is a great uh, review tool. Uh, everybody is submitting their versions to Shogun, like the stuff that they create. It goes quickly to the uh, to the supervisor, you know, you can you have a, a page, let's say, where you can see all these things. You can easily uh, look at them, annotate them, draw pictures, uh, uh, talk to the artist, which is involved, uh, like all sides can talk together. Uh, it's a really good stuff. Again, um, it connects to all our DCCs, which is quite helpful because, you know, when you are a small company, you only have limited uh, pipeline resources. There's, there's a guy who is basically coding your custom instruments, and uh, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to focus resources where, where it's uh, most productive. So, most of the, of the tools inside the DCCs, we use the ones that are, ones that are supplied from Shotgun because we don't have to write our own. And uh, it's, uh, it allows us to put our, our coding uh, person to things which are more, you know, necessary in the moment. Uh, then, then it's also a benefit that you have a standard thing that you can communicate with all, that, that all studios use. So industry standard tools are quite a, quite a nice thing. Uh, for example, if we have another company that we, that we are collaborating with and we have a, a project that has a certain, let's say they have another way of naming their files and, uh, you know, from ours, with Shotgun we can just change a template and share. And then all of the stuff that gets created and named by any application that you use is going to be uh, named in the same way uh, for, for only this specific project. Uh, and the two studios can have both of their files named the same way, which is you know, one of the things which are important. Uh, it also comes with RV, which is my favorite image viewer. Uh, can, can, you know, it supports all the formats that you would imagine. Uh, can even do simple slap forms, putting things on top of the other. Um, quite fast, uh, caches quite well, forwards, backwards. Um, any difficulties to show you, like your uh, comments and uh, the drawings and the discussions on the version, they are just right there on the side of the version, so you can um, see and comment and discuss in the same place. And it's uh, also integrated with inside the 
uh, your whole edit, so you don't just look at your shot, you look at the previous stuff and the next stuff, which is quite very important. Now uh, there's of course some of the uh, some of the instruments that we need, that we need to do, which we can't really get from anywhere, or, or you know the most productive ways to do them on our own. So we have a bunch of code, and the first versions were written by me uh, with some other artists. I'm shuffling in. Just, <laughs> just in two, two minutes. Just I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, in the beginning uh, I was. Uh, I did most of the, of the stuff, and uh, currently now we have uh, one guy who is full time just doing these kind of things. Um, and it, it's a challenge on its own uh, because once you have, uh, like, when you have the, the artists coding the pipeline, they have very good understanding of what it, need, what it needs to do and how it needs to do it. Uh, but they have limited the resources of uh, what they can they can do, and sometimes this is actually a good thing. You know, in a small company, you don't want to over engineer. Uh, these tools, uh, but then eventually you, you get uh, like some uh, some developers to, to make it, and uh, they're great because you know they have much better software design skills. Uh, the stuff is easier to maintain, but they are not art the artists, so it takes a lot of careful communication, so they can understand exactly what you need to do, uh, what what the coding needs to do, and we. We, yeah, we talk a lot about just the design of the whole thing because it makes so much difference in the way that you uh, go around and, and do things daily and uh, it's extremely important that you listen to the people who actually make a, a spend time with the thing to design it in the best possible way. And just saving you know, a couple of mouse muskets on something which happens you know, many, many times in a day is very important and you know, goes, goes a long way into actually making it more enjoyable in their life rather than fight with etc. Uh, and yeah, uh, <clears throat> when it was just Max, we were using MaxScript. Um, eventually, now we have moved to Python, which is everywhere. And the latest inc uh, incarnation with Max is actually amazing. It is kind of the same thing as MaxScript, so you just uh, write the same things in Python in the same way. Uh, super good. And uh, that's kind of where we are now. Uh, so, what we are looking forward to. Uh, is that basically uh, continue growing? There's uh, kind of the, the, the usual size movie chunks are a bit too big to be handled by a 15 people company, and uh, most of the, most of the time we actually do the hardest part of the work, and our partners partner studios are doing like the easier and sometimes maybe more lucrative part of the work, which is why we want to expand also to fit there <clears throat> and be able to take the whole movie chunk instead of. Uh, just like the most difficult part. And uh, there's also so many interesting new ways of uh, doing any, uh, new, new fields that animation is moving into. Uh, we are looking at, you know, like everybody is into the VR and AR space, which is still not there yet, but you would imagine in a few years when the hardware uh, is running well and everyone has these AR glasses, uh, it's going to have so much <coughs> more need for content than uh, what we are currently producing. So definitely, uh, that will be, I guess, you know, one of the biggest fields in a few years when, uh, when all of this content, everybody is walking around with their avatar, you know, well, on top of their head, and uh, there is parts of the environment which are designed actually rather than existing. It's going to be huge. So uh, getting earlier into that field would be something which would be quite smart. Uh, but then again, you know, when when you when you grow, it's challenging to keep the same culture. So so you know, to to, to, keep, to keep the place feeling the same way, uh, which is something that you know we have kind of I think dealt with uh, well so far, uh, going from like five to fifteen. Uh, but you know, when you go to let's say much more, maybe eventually this would be a challenge uh, to keep uh, you know having such a like, having cool culture. But you know, it's something that we that we do, and we, we do things, things naturally, take it easy, and it works. Um, and eventually, yeah, it's there, there's a lot of competition. Uh, there's a lot of people doing really cool stuff, but it has always been a place for great work. And especially now, when the whole um, just like computer graphics and animation field is growing so much, uh, there's always a place for people who do really great work. Uh, there's. Uh, it's kind of a guaranteed thing. So I think this was pretty much all I wanted to show you guys. And then, 
uh, keep in touch with me. You know, I like uh, connecting to people and uh, I help out as much as I can. You know, find me on Facebook or uh, I can, you can have my email here. And yeah, let's let's meet, let's let's connect, let's make great things together. And thanks.